Dear colleagues, uh, welcome to our roundtable. Uh, we are very excited to host this discussion. Uh, it is organized by the Center for Institutional Studies at uh, Higher School of Economics. And uh, I'm, we are very grateful uh, to our speakers and participants for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Viktor Dakov. Uh, I am a senior research fellow at Center for Institutional Studies and managing editor of uh, Higher Education in Russia and Beyond Journal. And I'll be moderating this event jointly with Maria Yudkevich, uh, Director of Center for Institutional Studies, Vice Director of HEC University and Editor-in-Chief of the journal Higher Education Russia and Beyond, to which you contributed. Uh, and uh, with a great pleasure, let me give a floor to uh, Maria Yudkevich. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Victor. Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon. For some people, good morning or good evening. Uh, for us, it's an exciting opportunity to bring together all our authors and experts community to discuss the topic of the recent uh, high education in Russia and beyond uh, issue of the journal, which was devoted to student employment. Uh, initially, we thought about our HERB journal as a um, opportunity to bring together people on the pages of the journal to discuss common hot topic of higher education in Russia and other countries. And now we also use this extended opportunity to see you all are together in one screen and to discuss what we learned from individual country cases and probably to enrich our understanding about those complex phenomena. So we wanted her today to make it possible for many people to share their ideas and insights about their countries, but also about common trends. And we do hope that it would provide us opportunity to, to have a bigger impact, not only on academic community, but also on policy community and to give some insights for universities uh, how to deal with this problem. And here at the round table as participants, we have many people from regional universities across Russia who are administrators in their own universities and who thinks a lot about these pro problems. So uh, it's really great to have so many people from so many time zones and universities. Welcome to our round table. Welcome to our HEC. And uh, I now give the, the screen back to Victor, who would chair our meeting. And I wish all us an enjoyable half an hour of general discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, actually, this round table is a continuation of our efforts, uh, which we started with a special issue of higher education in Russia and Beyond Journal, uh, which, as you know, was devoted to the problem of student employment, or as we call it, uh, combining study and work. And our aim was to build a full picture of student employment in the region uh, of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Russia and CIS countries. And uh, we were focused on such topics as motivation, determinants and labor ma market outcomes, uh, as well as educational outcomes of student employment. Uh, in other words, we wanted to understand why students combine study and work, who is more likely to combine study and work, and how does it affect uh, student uh, educational and labor market outcomes. Uh, today, we decided not just to summarize the main results of journal issue, but also go a bit further and discuss some new issues, uh, including the following. Uh, do students benefit from combining study and work? Are there any variations in patterns of students' employment by countries and by levels of education? and how universities should respond to students' employment, accept, struggle, or assist. And I am pleased to introduce uh, our uh, speakers uh, who are experts and excellent researchers in fields of higher education, economics and sociology of education, and labor economics. So today we have uh, with us Maria Berkens, uh, assistant professor at Leiden University, Netherlands, uh, Isabella Ostoy, Associate Professor at University of Economics in Katowice, Poland. Um, Larisa Titarenka, I, I'm not sure if she's with us now. Uh, hopefully she will join us. Uh, Larisa Titarenka, Professor of Department of Sociology of Belarusian State University. I'm here, don't worry. 
Okay. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Martin Guzzi, Assistant Professor at Department of Public Economics, uh, Masaryk University, Czech Republic. Uh, Marko Rupercic, expert on students' work from Slovenian Student Union. Uh, Tarus Jekinen, postdoctoral researcher at Finnish Institute for Educational Research of University of Uvascula, uh, Finland. Uh, Georgiana Michuds, uh, postdoctoral research fellow at Economic and Social Research Institute, Ireland. Uh, Saulia Bekova, a research fellow at the Institute of Education at uh, HSE University, as well as me and uh, Maria Yudkevich. So, and uh, just a few words on how the round table will be carried out. Uh, we have a keynote presentation and three rounds of discussion. Uh, during these rounds, there will be up to five minutes presentations by our speakers. After each presentation, we ask, uh, we, we encourage speakers to ask questions. You can raise your hand in Zoom and listeners are very welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I would kindly ask you to specify the person to whom you ask the question. And I would also kindly ask everyone to be concise in questions, comments and answers and straight to the point. We have some uh, time limits. And in the end of round, there will be a space for concluding remarks and questions. Uh, so let us start with the main part, uh, with the presentation of our keynote speaker, uh, Maria Berkins, uh, with the overview of student employment in Europe. Uh, actually, as I mentioned, uh, Maria's paper on student employment in higher education journal inspired my own PhD research and contributed a lot to the formation of my research interest. And I'm very happy to see you in person and give you a floor to you, Maria. Please. Yes, sorry, a little bit too many uh, buttons I had to find. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and also invitation for today, but also to the, to the journal. Um, I find the student employment a really exciting and interesting topic. And I completely agree with Maria. It's a very complex topic. Um, usually uh, when we talk to our colleagues in universities, either uh, academic uh, personnel, teachers, administrators, everybody has a very clear idea what the student employment is about. They have a very specific image uh, in their head, how they see a working student. But I think uh, uh, many here in this round table agree that it's a much more diverse uh, picture. Um, and, and often there are so many hidden um, uh, sides uh, uh, to it. Um, we know that uh, student employment differs quite a bit across countries. But we also see a lot of diversity within the um, uh, countries. So um, what do we really uh, know? Sorry, I'm not very, oh yeah, it's moving. So what do we really know about the diversity? Um, there is quite a huge uh, difference across countries to what extent uh, students work. Um, Euro student uh, survey is conducted regularly in uh, quite many European countries and gives a good um, overview. And we know that, uh, for instance, in Italy, Portugal, more than 20%, a little bit more than 20% of students work, whereas in the Netherlands, 80% uh, uh, work. So it's really a massive. But this is only the general uh, numbers. We also know that there is quite a large difference in how students work and what kind of works uh, they have. There is an occasional uh, employment of just um, uh, earning a little bit of a pocket money. There is a regular part-time work and there is also full-time working students. And these groups are very different and the size of these groups is per country very different as well. We also know that uh, in uh, um, what type of job students do differ. They differ by the type of institutions they visit, they differ by the discipline uh, of the uh, students, and also by country. 
Like if for many working students are primarily the nice young people working in a bar or delivering uh, your food at the, at the door, there are also countries where it's much more professional in the sense that uh, students work already in the jobs that they are trained for in, uh, in the university, or they do sort of a side work like giving a uh, uh, help to primary school uh, students, the, uh, the, the training, the hope schooling, uh, so to say. So there is a lot of variety across countries, but also within countries once you start uh, deep um, into it. Now, the, the key question for many of us is, uh, is it a problem? Should we see student employment as a problem? Is it, uh, is it a good thing? Or perhaps it's just uh, a, a neutral thing, a, a, a fact of uh, life? Many see it as a problem, and it is perhaps a problem in some countries where it's really massive. And it is a problem, or those who see it as a problem see it's a signal of something. It's a signal of insufficient financial means of the students. So they have to work to earn money. And why is it a problem? Then it uh, is a problem because it diverts attention away from what they should be actually doing, that is studying, so they sacrifice their learning. And ultimately, it's a matter of equity um, because some students come for better off families, they have a less of a pressure to work, and that creates an unequal condition for students uh, for studying and for future careers. Now, um, the other side of the story is that um, it's not necessarily the case. I look forward to the presentations uh, today as well about the relationship between uh, study results and working. We studied um, uh, this also in Estonia a few years ago, and our results show that actually student employment is not having a negative effect of study results. In some occasions, even the stu um, working students have better study results or better career prospects. Uh, uh, in the future. It can also be a solution, like if there is an environment that allows students to work, it may also mean that students with less financial means are able to continue their studies, so instead of a problem, it's a solution. Um, and uh, depending on the nature of the employment, um, we've also seen in some countries that student employment uh, is a way for uh, high achieving, high ambition students to profile themselves, to build up their CV, their career, and put them on the market much uh, uh, stronger way. So um, it can also be a good thing. Um, so I think as always in life, uh, the answer is somewhere in uh, between, or actually it depends. It depends on why students work um, in the first place. So what do we know about um, uh, why students work. I've, uh, I've called this presentation and also my article on student employment um, as a financial, economic and cultural phenomenon uh, to emphasize that there are different reasons. So there are very different picture uh, why uh, students uh, work. Financial reasons is of course the one that immediately pops up. It's a matter of money. And we do have uh, from many uh, countries also evidence that when the financial pressures go up, uh, students' uh, employment goes up. We had uh, recently a policy reform in the Netherlands, student support went down. We indeed see also that the uh, number of our students are working is going slightly up. So there is this elasticity going on. At the same time, interestingly, if you, if you compare the countries to each other, um, then it's very difficult uh, to draw a clear uh, line. So um, in, on, on this graph, I try to group countries based on how OECD describes the financial system uh, in higher education, the, how students cover uh, their education. So uh, number one, the Finland, Sweden, Denmark, are the... Um, it's a most student-friendly system of the no tuition free, very generous student support system. And if the logic is only financial, you would expect that those students have almost no reason uh, to work at all. But it's not true that there the student employment numbers are low. 
they are lower than, for instance, in Netherlands, where students are um, more uh, forced to loan, to lend money than, uh, than a free system. That's true. But at the same time, the numbers are also much higher than in Italy, Portugal, Turkey, uh, where the financial system is less uh, advanced. So if you look at the cross-country comparison, um, the financial reason is not the only one or perhaps not even a dominant one. So, okay, let's look at the second category. That's the economic um, reasons, how the labor market works, how the economy works. Um, the uh, uh, studies have, uh, many studies from some, some countries, I have to emphasize again, show that uh, economic growth matters or the stand of the economic, the health of the economy matters. Uh, during the economic growth periods, it seems that student employment goes up. And it's probably the argument that there are better opportunities uh, for students. There are better jobs available uh, for students. So that's uh, what uh, pushes them uh, to work. We can also see that in the countries where uh, youth unemployment is very high, students work less. Probably the opportunities are limited. Um, and there is less of an evidence, more of an anecdotal to see that also the flexibility of the labor market matters. Some labor markets, at least in European contexts, uh, are very um, structured or very uh, inflexible in the sense that you either work full time and are available full time or, you, or, or not at all. Um, uh, while others, for instance, the Netherlands is much more flexible. Part-time work is very normal, more normal than full-time work, actually. And also the flexible um, arrangement, plat platform economy developing and so on that offers more opportunities. So we do see that there is some elasticity to the economic reasons. But again, it doesn't explain all the cross-country difference. And then lastly, it's difficult to uh, prove with the evidence, but uh, I think the conclusion, if you can't, if uh, financial reasons don't explain it, economy doesn't explain it, then probably you have to conclude that, that part of it is just the cultural. Um, cultural in the sense that what students consider normal. And you can also uh, see that there are subcultures in some disciplines, um, students are much more likely to work, not only because of opportunities, but it's more normal. Um, and in, in, in other disciplines, not. So the same also across countries. What is the expectation of the student lifestyle? Um, what are the expectations in terms of the yeah, consumption, actually? Are students supposed to be poor? It's also part of the... Um, uh, culture, it's okay to be poor in your student life. You will, uh, that's an investment for your next life. Or is that not a norm? Um, now, what is interesting is that the cultural aspects are not independent from the economic uh, aspects or even the financial aspects because they all affect each other. Um, if you have more opportunities for part-time and flexible work, it also becomes more normal for students to work. If a student sees that other students work, they are also more likely to look uh, for work. So it, it is a cultural uh, phenomenon in the sense that students copy what others do, not only rationally looking if they need money or not, but also it's an interrelationship how the labor market, the student labor market around them works and adapts uh, to the student workers as well. So um, my time is uh, up. Um, so I, uh, I think that the presentations following very much feed also the, this discussion of different aspects, reasonings and results of the uh, student employment. And uh, I really look forward to, to hearing what, uh, what those individual studies have found. Uh, thank you, Maria, so much for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, any questions or comments so far? Actually, I've got one question, but I thought that we can uh, wait until uh, there will be some questions from the listeners. Okay, if you don't mind, I have a, a comment. Uh, Victor. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, from my view, I have no questions. Everything was clear. 
uh, from why, my view, there are so many common reasons why students work not only in our part of the world, but in uh, Western Europe as well. So it's just a, a, not a big one, but still a surprise for me that students in really well-off countries have to work because of financial reasons. Thanks. Thank, thank you for the, for the comment. Actually, I, I want to like continue this point of view a bit. Um, actually, I have a feeling that there are differences in the patterns of student employment between Western European and Central and Eastern European countries. For instance, there are differences in terms of uh, motivation and nature of jobs. Um, at least as far as I understood from the research literature, uh, like uh, students in the Western European countries are more likely to combine study and work due to the fact that uh, they need uh, mainly for financial reasons. And in countries of the Eastern and Central Europe, a uh, very important motivation is the accumulation of work experience. Uh, Maria, can you please comment on this? Am I right? Or uh, maybe you disagree with this point? Um, that is true. Uh, unfortunately, the Euro student is a bit less developed in, uh, in the Eastern, but, but I also looked into at least the Estonia, um, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, one of those two uh, included it. And I think you're right. At least if I have to comment how I feel, how things are, I'm entirely agreeing. I think the evidence is a bit uh, less mixed, but it's true. Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, but again, it's, all, well, let me put it this way. Uh, in, in big picture, yes, but there are, of course, nuances and there are also very big disciplinary differences. B what discipline people follow, uh, it's very different why they work or if they are even pushed to work. And there are more of those uh, disciplines where it's also expected uh, uh, a little bit more professionally oriented discipline that you have some kind of an, uh, uh, work experience to show. And that is also recognizable in more of the Western countries, as, uh, as you put it. But it is true. And I can also uh, see it's, it's also shifting. Uh, we started to, to follow more like from the 1990s, uh, the employment uh, in Estonia, where the economy really was turned around very quickly um, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And there we could also see that the labor market opened up, the new jobs opened up, and the students were doing primarily professional work. They already started working before earning their degree. And it was not a financial reason. That was not the real one. It was the, yeah, the challenge, the opportunity to work and to learn in the workplace. Um, and I do uh, think that that's, that's still much more part of uh, the working culture in, uh, in, the, in the Eastern part, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And there is also one comment uh, from Taru. Could you please uh, tell us just uh, your question? Yes, thank you from the really interesting presentation. I was just wondering that uh, have you considered how the age is affecting the student employment? Because in Finland, students are maybe more older in general. Yeah, now I haven't studied it, but I think it is true as in this, uh, Scandinavian. And um, um, it, it's true, and that's also the pattern difference that uh, uh, there are countries where also um, this uh, lifelong learning is much more prominent. So we, we uh, uh, usually, uh, when, well, in this discussion, we still think about the traditional student of young out of the high school uh, going to the studies. Um, but in some countries, of course, it's much more normal to come back to the studies afterwards and, and as a non-traditional student. And that's, I think that's a completely different uh, world and also uh, uh, sets very different expectations to universities, how to deal with this and to what extent it's, uh, it's a problem. In the Netherlands, we actually define it other way around. The problem is that we don't get the fully working students back to school, uh, that for lifelong learning, we should much more universities should adapt to these kind of students and, and that's not the strength uh, in the Netherlands. So I think you're very, very right, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you for your answer. And, and I see there is a one short question from Denise uh, Ananian, please. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, I have just a uh, clarification question. Um, do you consider student employment as a, uh, that means that students should be official employed or unofficial? Because I, I suppose there are uh, also cultural uh, differences in this, uh, in this case. Uh, and it depends uh, on labor market institutions as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, yeah, it's probably a good point. Like for my data source, uh, most data source comes is uh, student surveys, the, the Euro, stu Euro, Euro student, Euro student uh, survey. So I suppose students then uh, uh, report, um, yeah, the way they see it. I suppose uh, any, anything goes. Also, uh, just cleaning a house to somebody and earning money for it. Um, but it is true. But I think it, it has also a big difference. For, uh, for other things, like what also Victor said, is it about the uh, career building, professional development challenge, or is it just, uh, yeah, paying your bills? So yeah, it's, it's different. Thank you, uh, Maria, for your presentation and for your uh, responses. Uh, actually, uh, to make it a bit more interactive, I, I just have one survey. Of course, there is uh, some self-selection in our sample, but I would be very grateful if all of you, those who are here, will be able to answer these questions. We can discuss then just the results because it's it's really interesting. We, we have uh, a bit more people from Russia now, but uh, yeah. I can see the results, some of the results, and then I, I, I will show it to you. And after that, we can go to the uh, first round of our discussion. And I'm uh, asking Palina to uh, start uh, sharing the screen with slides. So we have 70% of people who already voted. Please uh, finalize this and I'll be able to show the results. Okay. Uh, so, uh, can you see it? And now? Okay, so we see that uh, half of uh, today's audience uh, like uh, combined studies with part-time job and 10% uh, uh, combined with uh, studies even with full-time jobs. So even among academics, uh, we can see uh, these people who combine studies with full-time job, maybe on campus, maybe not. And we have still 37% who uh, haven't combined study and work. So uh, that's interesting. And the main motivation, I see that uh, financial motivation prevail, uh, but also um, getting work experience, which is available in the labor market. I think it's a very uh, particular uh, story for uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, is also among the one of the important uh, motivation. And uh, actually we see that uh, almost uh, just, just, just one person believes that student employment ruins uh, academic achievement and uh, students don't, don't get anything from uh, combining study and work and uh, like um, the majority treat this as quite positive or absolutely positive or believe that the effect is mixed. So really interesting results. And uh, I would, uh, ask Palina to share slides and uh, we, we may start uh, our first round of um, discussion. And uh, the first presentation uh, uh, will be given by uh, Martin Guzzi, Assistant Professor, Department of Public Economics uh, from Masaryk University, Czech Republic. So do students benefit from combining study and work, Martin? Uh, hello. Uh... I'm based in um, Brno, in Czech Republic, at the Masaryk University, that is the second uh, largest university in Czech Republic. Uh, 
probably you know the Czech Republic is a migration country. We have a lot of migrants uh, from non-European countries, also from uh, Russian-speaking countries. And in general, like the inflow of uh, migrants uh, uh, feeds the or sorts the shortage of workers in the labor market. So um, in before the COVID situation, the unemployment rate in the Czech Republic was below 2%. Uh, so you can imagine that's very low unemployment. Is the For some years, it was the lowest unemployment rate in the uh, European Union. Also, youth unemployment was one of the low, uh, lowest. So this creates a lot of shortages of uh, workers in the labor market and opens opportunities to student work. Uh, at the same time, the employment, there, there is a, a temporary work contracts that are very attractive and those are very much used by students. Uh, so they allow a student to work or like any, any person can uh, uh, work on this contract up to 300 uh, hours per year. And if your salary is below 400 euro per month, uh, you pay lower deductions from your uh, salary. So it's uh, financially very attractive. Um, I, for, for my statistics, I use also Euro, Euro student data. That is probably the best data we have on a student's uh, life and uh, uh, also the work activities. So in Czech Republic, 70% of students, uh, based on the most recent uh, survey, uh, have employment and one third of students work more than 20 hours per, per week. So we can call it like uh, more regular um, employment. Um, from my experience, we have, I, I also have, uh, teach a lot of students, I supervise students and uh, at the economics faculty and majority of students work during their studies. Uh, it's super easy for them to find the work. Also, we have students who come for Erasmus uh, programs for one semester or for one year, and they quickly find the jobs in uh, in Brno. Uh, so it's uh, very easy. And um, um, I would say that employers are also open to hire uh, foreign students as well. Um, when you look at the Euro student data, um, uh, this, the motivation to work, uh, to combine the work and study is motivated financially on, only for the students with disadvantaged backgrounds. So if, uh, if they come from families with, uh, uh, with parents of lower education or low income uh, families. Um, so to your, um, Victor, to your question, probably I would add that the, there are also differences within the country and you may look at the different backgrounds of students uh, to find these financial motives may be much stronger at the lower status uh, families. Um, for most students, however, based on Euro student data, uh, the work is the way to gain experience. And uh, in our uh, research, we have the data on the graduates from Maserik University. We show that this uh, uh, work experience during the studies helps them to progress faster in their careers after the graduation. So it can be that this work experience um, is helpful. I would also mention that nowadays students have also opportunities to uh, uh, go abroad uh, for studies uh, through Erasmus program, Erasmus Mundus, uh, to travel all over the world. Um, so I would compare that also these kind of mobilities uh, bring benefits to students. So it's not only the work experience, but also the student mobility uh, can be beneficial. And uh, according to our uh, uh, analysis, but also from Euro, Euro student uh, survey, uh, we know that few students have difficulties or they, they report difficulties uh, when combining the studies and work. Uh, so it seems that it's uh, uh, beneficial for students and also for, uh, for the economy as well, uh, at least from, from these results uh, in, in the Czech Republic. Thank you. Martin, thank you for your presentation. Um, just uh, one quick question, actually. What do you think? Uh, is it worth uh, combining study and work in Czech Republic? Do students benefit from this? Like in, in, in one sentence, if it's possible. Uh, yes, I, I'm in favor of, of this uh, concept. Also, I would mention that the university studies allow students to combine work and study. So it means that they are um, less demanding probably. Uh, the students who go for mobility abroad to Western European countries complain that 
studied there are more, much more difficult and demanding. So they would not be able to, uh, to work uh, during their studies. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I would propose to uh, move to uh, our next speaker and then probably uh, to collect questions for uh, all three speakers. Um, so the next uh, speaker is Georgiana Michuts, uh, postdoctoral research fellow at Economic and Social Research Institute, Ireland. Georgiana. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, I haven't quite researched specifically the juxtaposition of work and study in European or the Eastern European context. But I do want to share some of my thoughts about what we know about the relationship between higher education and the labor market more broadly, and then also refer to some of the studies we have seen in the literature that tell us about some of the conditions that may make combining work and study to be more helpful for students in terms of their labor market outcomes. Of course, there are many other outcomes that might, we might care about in relation to what students gain during their studies and labor market outcomes are just one of them. Um, so there are many other trade-offs that we might wanna consider in parallel conversations here. Generally, we know that uh, the skills you bring, that the signals you bring and that the social networks or cultural capital that you bring to the labor market matter. And all of these things can be enhanced uh, through your studies, through various ways. As we have discussed um, in, in previous uh, conversations, there are multiple ways to do this. Study abroad may be one of these ways. Volunteering may be another way. Having very good grades, which no one asks for when you apply for a job may be another good way. Uh, but also having relevant work experience for the types of jobs you want to, uh, to uh, apply for in the future is another good way to, to enhance your odds on the labor market. Of course, in reality, the type of work that students do doesn't always align with the career plans they might have. So it doesn't always align with having the strongest skills and the strongest signals and the stronger networks for the career you might, might wanna have in the future. But if you're able to have the jackpot student job that allows you to do these things, that's something that you should definitely go for. Of course, the reality is a bit different. I also wanna mention that again, studying and work um, can be viewed on a spectrum here. And I think one of the most traditional ways that we see students engaging with the labor market during their studies actually through temporary work uh, outside of the academic year. So we see engagement through internships during the summers, placement during uh, winter breaks or such like arrangements. So it doesn't have to be continuous, uh, simultaneous work engagement. It can be through other, other means and it can be paid and unpaid. A lot of the work that students do doesn't necessarily have to be paid. And in some fields it's very often through volunteering capacity that you gain the right skills for the types of jobs that you might want have in the future. So those are all things to consider when we, when you make the decision as a student and when you create policy as an institution or a country to enhance or decrease these opportunities for students. So what do we know about specific aspects of the work experience that may actually enhance or detract from other goals we might have as students? So we do know actually that um, students who have worked during their studies retroactively view their study experience in more positive light than students that have not worked during their, their studies. This might be an effect of the fact that maybe you have some further advantages after study and then that makes you see your study experience in a more positive light, but it may be a function of just valuing the student time better uh, if you also have to do some more time on the side. So you have some comparison of, of the, the, uh, the different lives there. I also think that in this light, uh, st the study experience can be viewed, you know, the same way as we think about lifelong learning, we can think of study time as uh, facilitating learning across life domains. So what you can do at the university or technical institute is to, to draw different experience from different life events maybe study abroad, volunteering, work, internships to enhance the learning experience within school. So that's, that's definitely some, some benefit there, uh, both for teaching and the work life of students. We also see, and this is data that's very recent from the Eurograduate survey, that there is, again, decreased uh, likelihood of horizontal mismatch, increased skill levels, and increased political participation. So if you actually have some work experience during your study. So these are positive outcomes associated with work time during studying, even beyond the individual benefits that you might derive from the time you devote to work. 
But we also see some downsides to the practice of working. And a lot of the literature comes uh, here comes actually from the US context that has a very ingrained culture of work and study at the same time. In many cases, this is also part of the financial aid package that, that students receive. And there's just a very strong culture of, of engaging work during studying that if you actually work too many hours in addition to studying full time, that actually does lead to potential um, negative effects on your study. And also potentially these effects are highlighted if you work during the first year of your university, which is crucial for, for making a transition from uh, secondary to post-secondary training in all sorts of ways. I also wanna do a plug for a recent study that I've done. So I've, I've, uh, I've tried to see what the effect of university prestige is in the labor market for skill intensive sectors of the labor market to test if employers care about university prestige above relevant skills when hiring entry level graduates. This was a study that was conducted in English speaking countries. So the situation might be a bit different in the context we're talking about. But what I did see is that having relevant work experience as, uh, as created by internships uh, on resumes does actually eliminate the, the effect of the prestige in the labor market. So I would encourage graduates and students at all universities, particularly the least prestigious ones, to uh, um, to amplify their resume by gaining some work experience during their study. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Georgiana, for your presentation. Um, any questions or comments? I've got one personal question. Uh, Georgiana, did you combine studies with your work when you were a student? Uh, I, I did everything else. I did, I've done some paid work too. Uh, I was lucky enough to do some, uh, some work that was quite relevant for the work I'm doing right now, but I did a lot of all the other things you can do to enrich your, your study experience. So I did a lot of volunteering time, studied abroad. Um, and, uh, and I think coming from a system where you have uh, free higher education or, um, or a subsidized higher education um, is easier to make some of those strategic choices about what experience would enhance your future career better. Uh, yeah, thank you. And what I, what I also saw in your presentation, like there's a really important milestone which I saw in uh, plenty of literature, which I found in plenty of literature, is a milestone of 20 or 24 hours of working. Because uh, if you work less than uh, 20 or 24 hours, or if you work on campus, for instance, it's a mo less harmful uh, combining study and work in terms of um, your educational outcomes and brings a high, uh, very high wage premium. So it probably means like, uh, so wh why do you think it's the case? And why do you think uh, university prestige um, matters? Oh, so those are separate questions. So I do think that the 20 hours threshold uh, allows for time for learning more than anything else, right? So it makes sense that um, if you have more time for, for learning, you would do better than if you have less time for learning. So I do think that if you have to work 40 hours a week, then the resources you can allocate to studying are more limited. Um, and in terms of university prestige, so again, my study, I found no prestige effect. Uh, so I found that employers looked at skills and they didn't care about university prestige in that sense, but they may be an um, um, uh, effect of the fields that I looked at. So um, in many ways, sometimes when we're having conversations about labor market, we're having conversations about the best case scenarios, which is um, having the right job uh, with the right degree, for the students at the right universities. And that's, that's, that's definitely an exception when it comes to the experience of most people. So I wouldn't generalize to all fields when it comes to my own study. Uh, okay, uh, Georgiana, thank you for your uh, presentation. And we can move to the next uh, presenter today. <laughs> and surprisingly, it's me actually. Uh, today I'm in two roles. Uh, I just wanted to point out some uh, issues uh, with uh, uh, patterns of student employment in Russia, and I want to ask Polina to move to the next slide. Yeah, uh, thank you. So actually, do students benefit from combining study and work in Russia? Uh, to answer this question, I, I think it's really important to look at institutional context, and the institutional context is related to the fact that uh, Russian higher education system uh, experienced uh, rapid massification 
and this leads to the decrease of university diploma signaling power or signaling role. And in that sense, uh, getting work experience became a really important signal uh, for the employers and um, uh, university students. Uh, th this is why the, uh, the, uh, this was a very important motivation for university students to combine study and work. We see that the share of people who combine study and work in Russia is quite stable. It's about uh, 52%. And uh, uh, you can see this uh, graph for 2017, but if we absorb it from 2010 to 2017, it will be almost the same. And another peculiarity is uh, that for master's students, actually it's not uh, combining study and work, but it's rather combining full-time jobs uh, with study. So we have these uh, peculiarities of master programs when almost all students work. And in terms of motivation of student employment, the main motivation is gaining work experience and uh, uh, financial motivation is less, uh, is, um, is less important. And this is a really distinguished feature of uh, Russian uh, way of combining study and work. And another distinguished feature is uh, related to the fact uh, with the nature of the job. Because sometimes students, I don't know, may work in McDonald's. Uh, but in Russia, it's not the case. In the uh, majority of cases, uh, students try to work in the field which, when, uh, in which they want to work after graduation. For instance, if you are uh, studying law, uh, if you, you have major in law, you won't go to, I don't know, touristic firm or McDonald's or uh, anyone else, but you'd rather go to become a an assistant of lawyer or something like that to have the work experience and after graduation uh, to get better chances of for employment and higher salaries. And what we see from different data sets in Russia that students who combine study and work have a considerable wage premium around 20 to 36% compared to those who never worked. But this is true only for the early stages of career. This is limitation of our studies because we don't know what happens next. And what is quite surprising is that the impact of student employment on academic achievement is insignificant. And this might happen probably due to uh, low workload or due to different factors. It's, it's quite interesting to think why, why is this the case. And regarding the premium, I think there are both effects working. Uh, one effect is a uh, market signaling effect when students uh, gain uh, work experience as a signal in the labor market and uh, by this they increase their chances for uh, better employment and salaries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is an accumulation of human capital uh, because they actually get experience, which brings a premium on the labor market as well as uh, education. Uh, and I think it's really important uh, that uh, there might be different short-term and long-term effects. For instance, in the short run, yes, we see the wage premium for those who combine study and work during the early stages of career. But maybe in the long run, those guys who didn't combine study and work uh, and get uh, like better uh, human capital by putting more efforts in their education will overcome in terms of salaries and uh, career uh, promotion those who combine study and work and didn't uh, accumulate necessary skills in education system. So this is uh, my view, uh, and this is an interesting question uh, for uh, further discussion and further research. Like, are there any different difference between short-term and long-term efforts? So, any questions or comments, uh, complaints, disagreement? Uh, Victor, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, Bernardo. Uh, this is uh, about like context, and I don't know how does it work in Russia, but uh, at least in Chile, for example, like uh, it matters if you if you graduated from University A or University B, but no no employee no employer will ask you like which which mark you you graduated. So I'm wondering, I'm thinking that uh, as long as uh, you manage to get your your degree, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that much uh, if you let's say if you lost a bit of marks due to working, as long as you get your degree from a good university, I don't know how does it work in Russia or if like uh, when you're looking for a job, they will have a look uh, to see if you graduated with nine or with eight. Uh, I don't know how does it work. Because if it's, if people only care that you have a diploma from HSE, then probably it's worth to like devote a few hours, even if that uh, 
makes you lose a few marks, but then in the long run, you will be better, right? But I don't know how does it work in Russian. That's my question. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, I think that uh, academic achievement uh, doesn't matter that much in Russia, especially in case of master students. And uh, two most powerful signals in the labor market are university prestige and university quality, as well as uh, student employment. So the best strategy is to enroll to uh, HEC University and combine study and work gradually in the master uh, programs. And what is also interesting when we discuss uh, the impact of student employment on academic achievement and say that it is insignificant, uh, we deal with self-selection problem here because we observed only those students who didn't drop out and who actually completed their education. So yes, um, I, I see the question uh, from um, Maria Yudkevich. Uh, um, to all presenters, could you please uh, uh, announce it or do you prefer yeah, to Yeah, thank read? you, Victor. I have a general uh, question probably for all presenters. Now, after and having pandemic, so I think that the potential benefits and cost of student employment change because uh, first you can be employed online and that's completely different distribution of time between employment and, and study. And also you can study online. So that's uh, both factors which might drive for the change in the equilibrium so my question would be, what would, do you think would be new potential effects after pandemic in the long run? I jump, jump in first then. Very interesting question. Uh, it, it, I, I think it really it comes uh, down to the, the devil in his details. Like if I listen to Victor's um, uh, story, then I think there indeed uh, actually it can be much easier even to, to work for students because what you say that both the uh, education is online, the work is online with much more flexibility. Um, we see uh, in the Netherlands on the, on, uh, on the other hand that students at the moment come under a lot of stress because their typical jobs like working in a bar or working in, uh, in homeschooling and so on like these jobs all uh, fall uh, uh, away and there is also no um, yeah, replacement at the moment yet for these kind of jobs. Um, I uh, was very interested about Georgiana talking about uh, not only like the paid jobs, but also about their placements and internships and so on. We also see these have been really frozen. I think it's uh, temporary. It will, it will change it. Um, but I think the, 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 the answer is that it takes an adjustment. I think it, it will really change what kind of jobs students are doing. And, um, and then the reasons matter why, why they did it. So it's complex. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Any other opinions on that uh, sense? Uh. Victor, uh, I, I have no opinion on this issue because there are nothing, no jobs were closed in Belarus and there was no problem, unlike many other countries. But I have a question to you and also to our colleague from Masaryk University. It's the same question. You mentioned that uh, quite a lot of Russian students have job and uh, study combined. And uh, does it mean that uh, university authorities officially allow uh, just to miss the classes or maybe non-officially allow to miss the classes? And the same actually question to uh, our Czech colleague. Thanks. So I, I can briefly say that they don't control it. Uh, I mean, uh, attendance is a part of the mark, but not uh, the highest part. And you cannot attend, uh, especially in master studies, you cannot attend uh, lectures and maybe some seminars and even though you pass the exam. So that, that's uh, the answer. Uh, I think Martin, uh, this was also a question for you. Yeah. I would also say that they don't miss uh, the lectures. Uh, our university uh, has a flexible uh, schedule. So usually, usually the students combine all the lectures in two days a week and then they are free uh, three days a week. So they then find the job to work. 
lectures are not compulsory, only the seminars are compulsory. So in any way they can manage uh, uh, to catch, catch up with the classes and jobs as well. Uh, this is very interesting, but Martin, are you talking about master students or about undergraduates as well? Two days of study and the rest uh, days are free. Is it correct? Uh, of course, it's more, more likely for master students. Uh, at the bachelor, there are more, um, I would say, uh, at least first two years are very intense and they probably they can also do some courses in advance so in the third year of the last year of the bachelor bachelor is a free year program uh, they are more free to work so i i also have students at the bach bachelor level that they already work but those are the like call center jobs or um, um, probably a lot of skilled and more flexible with time schedules Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your co comments. Actually, we have the same in Russia. Students are most likely to start working on the third year of their studies uh, and uh, then in the master uh, studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, we can uh, finish with uh, the first round and we are a bit running out of time, uh, but we started a bit uh, later. So, uh, now uh, we have uh, the second round of discussion and the question is actually what are distinctive features of student employment in your country and um, uh, are there differences by level of education? And uh, the first presenter is uh, Larissa Titarenka uh, with very interesting case of uh, Belarus because they have really interesting system, some Soviet elements and uh, I'm very pleased to give the floor to you, please. Thank you, Victor. Uh, can you just uh, Palina, open my yeah. slide for yeah. me? Yeah, thank you. Actually, oh, it's again, yeah. Uh, actually, Belarus is really different uh, from whatever you just discussed and uh, explained us because, uh, for example, classes are obligatory and for missing the classes, a student can be kicked out at any level of education. That is why it's really just uh, an art to combine uh, study and uh, uh, even part-time job. Of course, master students are not so under pressure, but still it is obligatory. So sometimes it's a compromise between teacher and student, but officially it is checked by decanate. So it is not so easy. Uh, and this is exactly one aspect of our specificity. I mean that uh, all our uh, budget students um, do not pay the uh, uh, government or does the state pays for their study and uh, it means that the state wants uh, to from them to repay for this study uh, and for this reason they have to uh, work for two years at the place uh, to which uh, the state would just uh, uh, send them so it was like it is exactly like in the soviet uh, time when every student has special place to walk after graduation. Of course, only 45 students uh, are on budget money. So they are just like, uh, not really slaves, but something similar. And as for the rest, they pay for their study. So they are free. They can, uh, even if they uh, pay for study, if they miss classes, they still have just a possibility to be kicked out, but still it is not so uh, real threat for them. So they can miss something. But uh, students, uh, senior students, uh, nevertheless try to combine uh, study and uh, job, especially part-time job, because this is the only way just to escape the state mm, offer of a job because if the students who study on budget money uh, can find a place from which they can 
provide a special assignment for future job so they can be just so-called distributed to this place and they can uh, really have a job of their desire because they always try to find a good place for them. And if they do not have such a possibility, usually they have to go to any place the, the state would just uh, uh, tell them. And uh, in many reasons, it is not well-paid job. And that is why students uh, are not really happy to go to such uh, places of employment. But still, if they do not have job, if they don't want to have part-time job, if they do not have some connections to find just this special so-called invitation or assignment for future jobs. So they have to go to the place uh, of the state decision. And it is especially important for teaching universities because these graduates go to the place of the state assignment, not for two years, but for five years. And uh, this is just uh, more complicated to escape such a job because this is more uh, under control than any other specialties. So uh, regardless of whether th they are budget students or not, around one third of students have uh, part-time job during the study in the last courses. Uh, actually, our bachelor is for four years. So students on the fourth year of education are almost uh, just uh, focused on uh, searching for a job. And this is just also not very difficult for them because half of a year is just so-called internship. So there are no classes and nobody would control them. As for the other years of education, as I said, it is more under control. And of course, students, uh, whether they are budget or non-budget, they really benefit from combination of job and study because this way they can not only just earn money, either for themselves or to pay for their education, but also they can uh, earn some experience and they can find a place for future job. I think this strategy on labor market really is very popular among the students. And uh, actually this is a good strategy for the state as well, because why not uh, to allow young people to find a place where they can feel uh, interested, feel satisfied with their jobs. And uh, there is no actually efforts from the state. For this reason, there is no youth employment if you mean just calculation of percentage. Of course, some young graduates uh, do not uh, find a, a job if they paid for their study because they don't want to take any job. They really want to have a good job. But this is just, uh, I think, common for any country and common for the youth in general because nobody wants to have a bad job from the beginning of a career. So actually, this is a specific of Belarusian situation. And uh, although there are some nuances every year, new nuances, but overall, this policy uh, is uh, uh, running and there is no hope that it will be different under the current situation. That's all. Thank you for your presentation. I hope it's not what we so pessimistic, but it's really interesting case when students uh, combine study and work just to avoid mandatory distribution after graduation. And uh, let us move to the next speaker. And in the end, we can like have collection of questions and then uh, ask to all presenters. So I'm um, Marka Rupercic, expert from uh, Soviet um, Slovenian Student Union. You are very welcome to start your presentation. Oh, thank you, Victor, for uh, 
for for the uh, possibility to present uh, student work in Slovenia. I can see that uh, our regulation is a bit looser than in Belarus. Uh, so uh, in, in the article, I, uh, I was writing uh, about competencies in student work. And in this presentation, actually, I wanted to maybe just to show how student work is organized in Slovenia, because it's a, uh, it's a bit different case than maybe um, in other countries, uh, especially from the point of view that students and high school students also um, work student work. Um, I will be talking about student work as a type of work. Um, it's called students kotelo in Slovenian, so um, that's the that's the direct translation. Uh, so basically, so students and high school students are are different social group, and they have quite a unique social status. Um, they're in kind of this uh, intermediary process. They're gaining their own independence, but they're not really independent from uh, from um, their parents or from the country. Um, but being in the process. Um, so this situation calls for kind of different approach and uh, besides the usual scholarship systems, uh, system, uh, students older than 15 in Slovenia can apply for student work and uh, earn money in different, in, in, in that manner. So what we see is that um, Slovenian students, uh, this is data from also from your student, uh, St Slovenian students either do not work about 20% or they engage in full-time employment, uh, about 10%, but majority of them do student work. Um, so this student work started to develop uh, in Slovenia in late 60s, uh, quite informal um, students residing in uh, Rožno Dolina dormitories uh, started to deliver fresh milk to the surrounding neighborhood and uh, were paid for doing so. Uh, so this more informal system was inst institutionalized um, after the introduction of market capitalism, when um, agencies who were specialized for uh, delivering student work to students were formed. Um, so even today, they are legislated with the same legislation as employment agencies, uh, though they uh, have a different mission. mission. They um, provide temporary and occasional work to students and high school students. Um, it is important to know that it, it's a temporary and occasional work. Um, any type of full-time uh, job uh, would be considered as a, by legislation, as a full-time job. And um, th so the students uh, would have to be employed full-time by employers. Uh, we have court cases that uh, when, when students were um, showing that they did uh, more work than just temporary and, or occasional, and then the employers had to uh, pay um, um, for the pension fund, for the for the missing paychecks, um, for the years that uh, they should have. Uh, so this temporary and occasional work um, is is really important because obviously students have to combine uh, studies and work, and it's a uh, it's an hourly. Uh, type of work. Um, basically, all, the, all other types of work in Slovenia are based on 40 hours uh, uh, work week. Um, student work can be uh, work done just for an hour. So there's this really kind of uh, liberal uh, Western type of work, uh, really flexible. Um, and also the application for, for student work is um, speedy. So um, in this case, in, in, in this um, manner, students are positively discriminated. Um, their student work is relatively flexible compared to regular employment and uh, agencies, agencies work as an online platform. So students go on an online platform, they find work suiting their interest, uh, they arrange time and place of work with uh, employers and they receive the payment to their banking account. Um, another positive discrimination of, uh, of, of student work is uh, the rate of personal income tax, uh, where students can earn uh, up to 3,500 euros per year and do not pay income tax for, uh, for this amount. Um, other, especially legal aspects of student work are taken care of uh, by the agencies. So since student work is basically a type of contract work, uh, it's important to arrange this contract between student and employer. 
there are also some provisions in the Employment Relationship Act, which protects students at work, like protection against discrimination and uh, provisions on rest periods and reimbursements. Uh, so even though the basic focus, and as a student union, we really uh, uh, focus on, on that part, um, basic focus of student work is helping students to improve their social status and uh, to some ex extent even enables them to study um, because some, some parts of student population would not be able to afford to study if, the, if there would not be student work. Um, another part, obviously, which we are, we, which we are discussing today is, uh, is uh, gaining relevant work experiences. Um, we can see from different researches made in Slovenia that um, student work uh, does have uh, a lot of positive aspects. So students uh, search for their interests, they gain new skills, uh, they develop competencies, and um, in some cases, when uh, this work is connected to their field of study, um, they use their theoretical knowledge um, gained with studies and, uh, and write research papers and even bachelor or master thesis um, on cases uh, from their work. Um, obviously, building of social network is really important um, in, in, this, uh, in this part. Um, it is also, I would like to uh, repeat also for Slovenia, it is important to know that when students progress to higher uh, levels of education, um, so, um, and to higher years um, of studies, they search and apply for student work, which is more connected to their field of studies. So students are becoming more and more aware um, of the importance of uh, career building uh, at the end of their studies. So they, they search for, uh, more professional, more um, uh, skill intensive work, um, which would help them to, um, to, to uh, find uh, full-time employment after graduation. And uh, we also see that um, it is, the student work as such is an important stepping stone in Slovenia, since more than 50% of the students get full-time employment um, where at the employer where they did student work uh, while studying. Um, uh -huh. And also another thing, which is which is maybe unique. Uh, so concession fees on student work, uh, finance building new student dormitories. They uh, also fund. They also finance scholarship fund in in a part, and uh, or they uh, and uh, student organizations. So that's thank you, Mark, for your thank you, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very interesting case uh, of Slovenia, but. Actually, there might be difference not only between countries, but also between levels of education. And I'm delighted to uh, give the floor to Saulia Bekova, a research fellow at Institute of Education of HSC University with her presentation on uh, differences in uh, patterns of student employment among doctoral education students. So Saulia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to um, be the part of this um, uh, roundtable. So my focus is a slight a bit different from the rest of the um, participants. And as Victor said, I will tell you about the doctoral student employment as it's the focus of my research. Actually, the picture on the doctoral level is quite similar to the situation that Victor described on the undergrad on the ma and master level. And uh, most of doctoral students combine study with work and actually uh, they do not consider study as the main activity because uh, up to 90% of them in level is differ uh, in different universities, but up to 90% of them are employed. And uh, as you see, as you can see, most of them uh, work off campus. Of course, uh, if we want to talk uh, about the factors, the reasons of uh, such massive uh, employment uh, Students themselves report that the financial, low financial aid uh, and uh, is the most uh, important reason for them to combine study with work. And most of them work off campus, 65%. And uh, a majority of those students who work off campus uh, occupy non-academic positions. Th they work is not uh, related to research or teaching. As you can see, only almost a quarter of them um, occupy research positions and uh, like uh, the lowest part is um, um, engaged in teaching in 
uh, different uh, in other universities, in uh, schools and colleges and so on. And uh, this group, this actually the place of employment is uh, like critical part of my uh, short uh, presentation because uh, these two groups differ in terms of um, graduation outcome. Uh, like the first group off campus, uh, students working off campus are um, in less uh, advantage position. They uh, have, they struggle more with the combining work or study. They interact less with their supervisors. It's harder for them, especially for those who work full-time, it's harder for them even to commute, um, let alone work on thesis. They, but this group also do not plan to work in academia. And actually they uh, report, um, the motives to enter the doctoral program as uh, to promote their career outside the academia in the first place. Uh, they work is often unrelated to the thesis, so it's harder for them to combine uh, both activities, but this group is more financially secure. So they struggle more, but uh, those who work full-time, they feel uh, more financially secure than other groups. Uh, the second group working on campus, uh, it's lower, only 35% work on campus and most of them uh, occupy research position. But as you can see, the sum is more than 100%. So uh, it means that they combine uh, more than one activity in university. But most of them are engaged in research activity, uh, but there are some uh, major field differences like uh, STEM doctoral students uh, uh, studying in STEM uh, direction. Uh, they uh, often occupy research position. Uh, in the meantime, uh, students that study social science or humanities are uh, more often occupy teaching or administrative positions. So that also have an effect on their uh, thesis work. Because those who uh, work on research position, they benefit from the tight relation between their work activities and uh, thesis topic. So they have a uh, less um, challenging um, period of, uh, in their career, in their study, because uh, they practically do the same or similar, uh, really similar work while they're working or they working on their thesis. And actually this group working on campus have more chances to defend the thesis. It's based on our longitudinal data sets uh, on HSC. And especially those who are on research position, they have uh, more chances to defend the thesis. And they, uh, this whole group, uh, students working on campus, they plan to work in academia. They enter the program uh, to work in R&D uh, in general, and uh, they plan to stay uh, actually in the same university they study. They want, to, it's the, not dream job, but they, something of their goals. And uh, they have less uh, issues combining study with work. But uh, if we want to talk about the like uh, positive effects, uh, those who work full-time, both off campus and on campus, uh, they are more determined in terms of their career prospects. Uh, those who don't have a job or have occasional job or even have part-time job, uh, they really struggle with their career plans, career trajectories and, and the toll. So um, as well as on undergraduate level, uh, employment has both positive and negative effects. So. That's all, that's all I want to say, thanks. Uh, so Leah, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, now we, ha we have uh, some time to throw the questions to all three presenters, uh, but I see the question from Marie Yudkevich. Uh, actually, uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, there might be variations not only between countries and levels of education, but the situation might be heterogeneous also in across disciplines. So what do you think uh, is the situation heterogeneous uh, across disciplines? Or for example, is there something specific about STEM students? Like uh, this is a question to anyone, to, to, I mean, to everyone uh, who participate, uh, maybe uh, Maria, 
uh, do you observe any differences by uh, disciplines? Or maybe, yeah. Yeah, as I also mentioned, the discipline, um, uh, I, I don't have a hard, hard uh, facts and percentages uh, in my hand, but we uh, have indeed seen that the discipline matters greatly and on all respects, it um, yeah, needs so much for financial reasons. Usually students have the same uh, uh, support uh, system, but it matters for, alter for job opportunities, the job prospects, what, 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 uh, how attractive are the uh, job opportunities for, discipline, for different disciplines. And it matters also for the, the cultural element that what's uh, considered to be normal, what's a normal student, is it working or not working? Uh, so we do see the difference in, uh, in, in more of the social sciences, the economic social sciences side, as opposed to more uh, humanities. And then the STEM field is always interesting because on, an, on a one hand side, there is a high demand. On the other hand side, it seems also be in many countries, a more demanding one uh, where a combination with a, with a real professional job is more difficult at least at the, at the lower educational levels. So yeah, what we see is indeed that disciplinary differences are quite, uh, quite strong. Maria, thank you so much. I see Marco raise his hand, uh, so please uh, go on. Uh, yeah, um, I would say for Slovenia, it's not so much um, different situation across dis disciplines as much as for certain study programs. So uh, we see from, especially from your student survey, that we have uh, certain study programs which are very intensive. So students can, it can take up to 40 or 50 hours per week for students to uh, just work on the study program. And it's usually the more, how I would say, a uh, professional type of study program. So uh, study programs such as medicine or uh, veterinary or uh, architecture, uh, even these more regulated occupations, uh, which have really a uh, direct path to a certain, certain profession. So basically when a, when a student of medicine starts studying, he knows what he will be doing when he graduates. Um, on the other hand, we have students on uh, maybe in, on social studies who have uh, who do not have such a direct career path and those students are more likely to engage uh, in student work um, if for nothing else for the career building um, uh, part of the of the work um, uh, okay thank you and I see there is a Comment from Taro. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, we uh, conducted a, a small study a couple of years ago, and we found out that uh, many IT students in Finland drop out their studies because they uh, transfer to uh, working life quite early. In IT sector, there is a lack of employment in many places, so they try to engage the best students very early uh, during their studies already. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are huge disciplinary differences. Yeah, I think we observe the same in Russia to some extent. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so thank uh, for presentations. Uh, do you have any questions to our three presenters? Uh, some specific question to uh, our presenters today, Marco, Larissa, and Sole. Um, if we don't have a question so far, uh, I would propose to move to the round three. Uh, this is, uh, I think, most uh, debating part uh, because we need to uh, understand how universities should respond to employment, uh, accept, struggle, or assist. And I'm uh, delighted to give the uh, floor to Isabella Ostoy. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, an answer to this question uh, is difficult, I think. Um, except, uh, I think, only if there is no conflict with study. A struggle, I'm not sure, but uh, probably not. And uh, assist, uh, I think yes, but uh, in a special way. And uh, you can see uh, on the slide a few uh, examples from Poland, 
how to replace student employment by creating opportunities to earn money and gain work experience, which were the most important for students combining study and work, according to results of my research. First way are paid internships for students, for example, 120 hours in three months, matched to the schedule. And uh, University of Economics in Katowice runs uh, such a program for master students and remunerations um, in this program are subsidized by European Union Fund. It's an uh, operational program, uh, knowledge, education and development. Uh, the second um, opportunity uh, are practical study programs. It's a new way, it's a new field of, of study, which more internships hours in study program. It's matched to the schedule too. Uh, for example, three months of internships a year. Norm uh, typical is uh, only one month. And the third uh, possibility are uh, dual studies, similar to German system. Uh, some universities of technology and other universities in Poland uh, implemented programs of dual studies with partner companies. For example, Volkswagen in uh, Poznań. Uh, and I can say that uh, the third way is preferred by students, but it's very difficult because of the lack of companies which can lead uh, to dual studies. Uh, we, I can say that in Poland, we, we have no culture, no tradition of dual studies and we try to build it. And uh, thank you, that's all, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Isabella, for your presentation. Uh, we will discuss it uh, after, after the second presentation uh, and ask the questions. And I'm also delighted to uh, invite uh, Taro Siekinen uh, with the same uh, question, like what should universities do to respond to student employment? Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, in our paper, we studied work and studies during uh, the COVID situation in Finland. And uh, uh, more than half of Finnish university students work during the academic year and more even in the summer break because in Finland, uh, working while studying is kind of a virtue, like a working is itself without studying as well. So also uh, high school students work, uh, especially in summer times. And it uh, working while, while studying causes better labor market outcomes after graduation, but there are many uh, challenges as well. Because, of course, if you work a lot, there's not so much space in your studies in your calendar, as we have uh, discussed before already. So what happened in last spring uh, when this COVID epidemic hits all over in, uh, in Europe and in everywhere? Uh, in theory, Finnish university students could easily substitute work with studies studies when job opportunities disappear, but of course it requires universities to react quite quickly to new circumstances. So in Finland, uh, many university students work in service, so there were a lot of uh, unemployed uh, young uh, people in Finland. Uh, and the switch to online teaching was hard on some students, but created new opportunities for others. So I, I think that this uh, switch might even um, um, support the equal opportunities for all students. Uh, but there are some challenges, of course. And uh, they were... And, uh, con it's, it's continuing, of course, that uh, students have had some mental issues because they are lonely at the moment, because they can't participate in, in courses and see, see people. So monthly credits per students were uh, around 3% higher nationally for the end of the spring term 2020 compared to the same months in earlier years and around 20% higher for June and July. 
So as the, the job opportunities disappear, students started to work more. And this has uh, raised some questions because there have been a lot of discussions that uh, we should uh, decrease uh, the study time of university students and push them more uh, quickly to the labor market. That should we offer those, or university should offer those summer courses more after this COVID situation also. So there are many, many aspects in this situation. But I recall that as I was a student, like uh, 15 years ago, this thing was a really big thing then as well. And I remember as a student that I felt really frustrated that I, the university didn't offer to us any summer courses or uh, didn't offer enough summer courses. So, so there's some issues that should be uh, considered in the university level. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Taro. And uh, so do we have uh, any questions to our presenters? Uh, this is a yeah. question for me. <laughs> yes. yes, Isabel, I've got a question for you. Actually, what is your personal opinion on these dual programs? Uh, because, uh, for instance, in Russia, it mainly works in uh, uh, vocational education and training. And if I'm not mistaken, in Germany, it's the same. So how does it work in uh, higher education? What do you think? Uh, is it a good way to assist? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, dual studies uh, should be well organized uh, and uh, well matched uh, to the schedules. I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, then it's okay, but um, it uh, depends on uh, of the field of study. Not field of studies uh, uh, can be realized as a dual uh, studies. Uh, I let my, my researchers uh, amongst uh, students of economy, um, master students, and uh, it was uh, the preferred by them, uh, the, the preferred way of, of, uh, gain, uh, of gaining uh, uh, professional experience. So I think that uh, that is uh, um, good, good model, good way, but, but um, we should uh, um, know that uh, academic studies, fully academic studies, can be dual studies. Only some of um, some field of studies can be realized by by dual. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your um, uh, answer. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Taro, what do you think? Uh, how universities? Uh, what uh, mechanisms could be used uh, else to assist students to help them? To help them graduate well. To help them graduate or to help them combine? <laughs> uh, ah, to help them combine. Well, more flexibility, of course. And as we discussed before, uh, the Finnish students are a bit older than in many European countries. And they are, uh, they are I think they are like around 20 sometimes when they enter higher education. They have some like uh, three years after higher uh, high, high school. So, and it's really hard to get into university. So I think that the flexibility is, is one thing. And of course the open university is really popular in Finland as well. So they offer courses in evenings and in weekends. So those are the main things, flexibility and mentoring of course, and supervision. Thank you. And can we have a kind of a very blitz session? Like uh, I would ask all experts to answer this question. Actually, should universities, uh, how universities should respond, struggle, accept or assist? Uh, Maria, what, what is your opinion towards this? Um, I think uh, uh, twofold. <clears throat> 
Well, I think assist uh, would work. And I think we also have uh, quite nice uh, examples, uh, particularly more from Anglo-American countries like the UK and US, where the um, uh, universe, uh, universities are much more open of creating uh, the job opportunities because as also um, uh, Georgiana, I believe, uh, told us that when uh, when students work uh, less hours close to campus then the the effect on the study is much better so i think the universities could assist in terms of creating a good and smooth uh, work opportunities and thereby also address some of the financial uh, issues but then i think second not relevant for every country but for some other countries is also this uh, uh, issue of the lifelong learning um, I think sometimes also universities are very closed in the sense that we do things the way we do, uh, which also doesn't accommodate sufficiently students that work full time. It's a completely different student population, completely different problems. But nevertheless, yeah. is it an open university? Is another format? But at least if universities realize that sometimes they also need to do things differently in, in, in order to accommodate uh, fully working students. Okay, thank you, um, Maria. What do you think? So sorry, I put this, but yeah. Uh, Maria, what is your attitude towards uh, what, how universities should respond to students' employment maybe a bit uh, more? Uh, are you asking me or? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you as a university administrator. <laughs> uh... In Russian, there is a proverb saying that if you can't stop a disorder, you should become ahead of it. So I think that uh, if you can't uh, change something, you should not only accept that, but try to be an active part of that, which means that uh, it's important that university uh, are in close contact with the labor market in the sense that there are some key potential employment for em employers for students and it's important for the university to uh, suggest flexible opportunities for students uh, to get internships and part-time jobs or through, through some key exper experts in the market. I think it's important. And I do agree with those who are saying that it's kind of a very subtle dilemma uh, and how to keep a balance between flexibility and being a like residual, residual claimant for the university. I think it's still important for students to understand that university is a like first priority for them uh, for those years. And it's important for university to keep this balance for for students. And I also agree that uh, there's a huge diversity around disciplines. So if you, for example, wanna be like social worker, it's important that you have part-time in this field from the very beginning. But if you wanna work in the nuclear physics, probably you should better concentrate or, on or, you know, studies. Uh, this would be better for everybody at the end of the day. So that does depend. Uh, thank you for your answer, um, Martin. Uh, I hope you are with us. Uh, you can hear us. Uh, what is your uh, attitude towards this question? Like how universities should respond to student employment? Hello. Yeah, I, I would agree with the, with the speaker that uh, to accept it as, as was your... Um, also the survey question, uh, I would suggest, I, I would be in favor of the accept option, definitely. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, uh, Marco, are you with us as well? I'm here. Uh, great. Uh, so what do you think, uh, how universities should respond to students' employment? I would be grateful if like anyone could uh, tell briefly their opinion and then like kind of. Well, I'm, I'm, in Slovenia, the situation is like this. So student work, as I have described it, does not have anything to do with universities. In fact, I mean, the, the agencies are private agencies and uh, provide work, which is 
basically available on the market. Um, universities do uh, work with employers when, uh, when they are uh, searching for, uh, how should I say, practical education. Uh, so um, these are uh, a part of studies which is done um, at the employers. So this, this can be uh, like in all of the fields, uh, but in academic programs, uh, much less. So basically what I would like to say is that yes, universities, faculties, um, education institutions uh, can really help uh, students to find uh, employers where they can develop their, their uh, competencies and their skills and their knowledge uh, on the field where they, where they, where, where they study. So from, from this point of view, I think it's really important and it's, and it's possible for universities to do that. Uh, thank you, Marco. So I think we have a time for uh, maybe a couple of comments. Uh, I see uh, Larissa, do, 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 you, do you have uh, like uh, an answer to this question? Like how universities should respond, do you think? I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, okay, then at least we <laughs> asked those who appear and I can uh, show you the results of the, um, actually of the questionnaire and this see that uh, the majority of our uh, participants today feel that we need to assist students and also accept and uh, we don't have anyone who believe that we need to struggle or fight with students employment. And uh, I would like to give the word to uh, Maria Gutkevich. Uh, for a comment. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for presentations and I really enjoyed like learning her individual country experience and when listening to that I was thinking that probably in a future decade, next decade, we're gonna have situation change a lot because what we have now is the model that students spend their few years at the university and then they go to the labor market. So, so we have studies and we have work for the whole life. But it seems that we move for quite fast toward uh, work li uh, like lifelong study. So we're gonna study for the whole life, which means that study that wouldn't be just concentrated for a few first years, they're gonna be distributed through the whole career, which means that the whole issue of of that would be changed in a way that all employment would be student employment because we're going to be students for for a longer part of our career which means probably that would also change our approach to how we should deal with that because many of us i believe that now are studying something we are studying new languages we are studying her how to use her data how to retrieve data how to, I don't know, analyze something. So we learn a lot even in the mid of our careers. And many people are now changing jobs and also get back to our universities to learn. And universities should also be able to provide very flexible services for those students who are age students who are in the middle of career and still, I think, very interesting question to explore further. So my point would be that the whole concept of student employment is changing those years very rapidly. And of course, I believe that it's really exciting topic for our community to stay with further. And thanks a lot for being a part of this discussion today. Uh, yeah, I can just add a few words. Uh, I uh, wanted to thank you all for participation in the event and for your contribution to the HERP issue. And I'm very grateful to all speakers of today's discussion, all contributors, and particularly also to uh, our uh, keynote uh, speaker, Maria Berkens, and also to Paulina Bugakova, who helped me in coordination of this issue and event, she's with us. Um, it was a great pleasure for us to host uh, the roundtable, and uh, I hope uh, most of you found uh, uh, our conversation and ideas uh, relevant and that it will have a contribution to your research 
uh, maybe formation of opinion and possible policy measures related to solution of this problem. Uh, so, uh, Mar Maria, do, do, do you want to add something uh, on this? No, only thank you for bringing us together. And I, uh, I think uh, also Maria's point is very good. Perhaps next time we don't talk about student employment, we'll talk about students and employment because these things are not any more uh, separable. Yeah. Uh, so, so any, any other uh, re re remarks from, from someone? Um, okay, okay then. Thanks again uh, for participation in uh, our roundtable and uh, take care and have a nice day. Everything good to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you.